Um, you got your Bible? If you have your Bible, say amen. If you don't, um, you know, feel shamed. That's the goal here at church. We want you to feel guilty and shamed, you know. Uh, no, that's not true at all. We, we're glad you're here. And if, uh, if you got your Bible and it's on your phone, that's wonderful. If, it, if it's a physical Bible, that's phenomenal. Um, we, we think that God uses both of them. Um, God uses the same message for years and years and years. And for thousands of years, he's used this, this book, the, the book of the law, the, the book of the Old Testament, the book of the New. And he's, he's spoken to us through this Bible. And so every time we open it, he speaks to us. And today I'm really excited as we kind of head into a new season. I'm I'm excited for the church that's maturing and growing. We, we just left a series called More Mature, More Mature. And I, I love what God did as we read through the book of James together. And it's been really exciting to do that. But today I'm, I'm just like, I, I couldn't be more excited to speak about this topic, which is um, uh, f- Freedom Foundations. We're going to talk about Freedom Foundations today. Um, and and I, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about laying foundations for your future laying foundations so that you can have freedom in your life. And our text is going to be Romans 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to stay in Romans 8. And I haven't done this with this church yet, but I have no time constraint on this sermon series at all. We have the rest of the year planned out. We, we every year sit down with our team and, and look throughout the year how, what we're going to say next and do next. But um, I, I've spoken to a few people. I've asked for permission. And, and we decided that we're going to stay in Romans 8 for as long as we need to. So we might be here for four weeks or we might be here for 12 weeks. I don't know. But that's kind of exciting, right? So we're going to get into this, uh, this beautiful passage of Scripture. And um, if you don't know anything about Romans 8, can you just allow me to geek out with you for a second, okay? So if this is the Bible, right, the Bible's amazing. And the Bible's got some topography. It's got some, it's got some heights and lows and depths to it. It's, it's got some ca- caverns and valleys and, and, and different terrain. And the Bible's just this magnificent masterpiece in so many ways. But if the Bible is this beautiful uh, place that has highs and lows. The book of Romans is the Himalayas of the Bible. It's really the Himalayas of the Bible. Many scholars and theologians would argue that it might be the most important book, significant book when it comes to our theology of faith. If this is the Himalayas of the Bible, Romans 8 is Mount Everest. Okay, so Mount Everest it is the highest peak. It is the highest peak in the Bible. And, and why I say that is that we're going to start to unpack this. But as you look at it, you realize that there is so much be, uh, understanding of the doctrines of our faith, theology, all in this single scripture. Martin Luther, he said this about the epistle of the Romans. He said it's the true masterpiece of the New Testament. It can never be too much or too well read or studied. And the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes. The more you read it, the more you study it, the more powerful and, and, and true it becomes to you. One theologian said, if your Bible were to fall to the ground, it should, it should open up to Romans 8. That should be the most torn up and used and looked at passage in all of Scripture. There's a belief right now, and, and it's been studied by Barna, that about 6% of Christians have a biblical worldview. Does anyone know what that means? A biblical worldview. If you don't know, it's because you don't have it. A biblical worldview means that you do not look at the world through the lens of the world. But you look at the wor- world through the lens of the Bible. You look at the lens of creation through the Word of God. Many, many say today that, and we talked about this at the end of last service, that many would say that simple is stupid, but simple is not stupid. Simple's really smart. I, if I look at this device right here, it looks very simple, but my God, it's very powerful. And the more simple the operating system, the more user-friendly it is, and the more people use it. I'm so grateful that the gospel is simple, but was designed by an incredible creator, that made it accessible so that every single person, no matter their educational level, no matter their social status, no matter where they were in life, they could access it. I'm so grateful that we can all touch it and be close to it and become intimate with it and we don't have to have a degree or a master's in theology to approach it. I'm so grateful for the grace of God and what Romans 8 teaches us that we do not lay the foundations of our faith but Jesus has already laid them. 
I'm so grateful for the freedom that I have in Christ. I'm so grateful that this book begins to help me unpack it. In America, we have the Declaration of Independence, right? The Declaration, does anyone, everyone know what that is? No, okay, that's, uh, that's rough. Okay, Whew. I have to rethink my next week. But if, if we have a Declaration of Independence, this is the Declaration of Freedom, Romans 8 for us. This is the document, this is the, this is the central picture of what it looks like to now be free. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to read just four verses with you. And what I love about Romans is it opens up with, there is, Romans 8 opens up with, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, we're going to read it in a second. No condemnation. And then the whole chapter closes, 39 verses, and the chapter closes with this, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I mean, it's just, it's really good. So it begins with, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and it ends with, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. It's phenomenal. There's 39 verses, and 19 times the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, is mentioned. It is a very powerful book, so we're going to read these first four verses together. Are you excited? Do you have your pen and paper? Get your notes out. Extra points in heaven for taking notes. Romans 8. We're just going to read four verses together. So now, I'm reading in the NLT. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body, like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Some of you are like, man, that's awesome. And some of you are like, what the heck does that mean? We're going to have some fun. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun. On January 1st, 1863, My friend explained the moment the other day at a conference. He talked about this, and this is where I'm getting this opening from. My my friend, Pastor Levi Lusco, he he, he went before about 65,000 youth in the Mercedes-Benz Theater, and, and he quoted this moment. He talked about this moment where in 1863, January 1st, Abraham Lincoln, he signed what was called the Emancipation Proclamation. Does anyone know what that is? The Emancipation Proclamation was this moment that was signed into effect by Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln signed this into effect this day so that every free would be, every slave would be a free man. And that day was very significant for a number of reasons. And I want to tell you why. That day was significant because everyone who was once enslaved has now become free. And we know that later on, Juneteenth had to happen because the word didn't get to Texas yet. And there's all this other stuff that had happened in between that. But that day, Abraham Lincoln signed that document. But if you look at the signature, the signature has a little shake to it. It's not as clear as Abraham Lincoln's other signatures. And, and, and why is because that day his hand was shaking. His hand was shaking because it was also the first of the year. And it was the custom since George Washington that on the first of the year, the president would shake hands with every single person in America that wanted to, be, to shake his hand. And so there would be a lineup. I think it was uh, Teddy Roosevelt who had more than 8,000 people lined up to shake his hand. Can you imagine shaking 8,000 people's hands? I know some of you are like, did he have Perel? But that day, Abraham Lincoln, he shaked thousands of hands. And the reason why his hand was shaking was not because he was not confident of what he was doing. And he wrote this later. It was because he wanted, it was because he was so proud of the decision. And he wrote later, I wanted to do it on this day because this day was also known as something else in America. It was also known for the white people as hiring day. 
It was the day that the, they balanced the books of your business. So what we know about slavery is that slavery was not just a, uh, a problem with ethics and justice and, and humanity. It was also a real issue in economy. There was a lot of money to be made in slavery. And so that day, that hiring day, would be a day that the night before you would balance your books and you would decide, I'm going to sell a slave or I'm going to give it away. It's so terrible. And so you'd wake up the next morning if you were a family member who had someone sold, and you wouldn't know if your mother, your sister, your brother were sold into slavery the next day. So, so the white people in America had it. They called it hiring day. But the black people in America had a different name for it. Does anyone know what that name was? They called it heartbreak day. It was a day of tremendous heartbreak. Because they didn't know where their family members were the next day or what would have happened with them. Absolutely terrible uh, atrocity in America. As we know, even here in Hawaii, there, there's been many plights that have been done by people for, for commerce and for business and for self-interest and self-gain. Absolutely horrific. And the truth is, is that sometimes every good day also has a horrible day. And we all have a heartbreak day. We all have a moment in our lives that are difficult times that we need freedom. And we don't know where to get that freedom, but I'm so grateful for the country that we live in. I'm so grateful for America. As much as it's terrible, there's also a lot of freedom that we have today. The fact that we can gather here in Waimanalo in a public school and talk about Jesus, a lot of us need to thank God for that today. Now... Is it perfect? Are we making excuses? By no means. We got a long way to go. Hello? We got a lot to do. But I'm grateful for that. But I'm grateful that on our worst day, Jesus also did something very powerful. And he didn't sign a document with blood, with, with pen. He signed a document, a covenant with blood. And what he did for us 2,000 years ago is when he died upon that cross, he set us free for all of eternity. And because of that, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. What the law could not do, Jesus did for us. Come on, church. It's powerful what God has done for us. It says in verse 8, it says, so now. Somebody say, so now. In the, in the, in the NIV, it says, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should look at that and say, you should ask, what was there before? That's how you do you know, from a literature lesson, right? And so if you see therefore, you should always look. It's, it was originally the, what was there before. Well, what was there before was the law. What was there before is that there was a certain way that we could have access to God. But because of what Jesus did, we are now free. And one of the things that I want to say is we have a growing congregation. We have a culture of how to, how to, how do I do it, how do I do it, how do I do it. So I take a cold plunge. After the cold plunge, I sauna. And then after the sauna, I do this and I do my breath work. How, 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 how do I do it, how, how, how do I do my faith, how do I do it, how, 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 how. We live in a culture of how, 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 how. If, if I, I got to know, I got to know, I got to know, I got to know. But I love the gospel. I'm so grateful the gospel is not a how-to book. I don't know. It, it, it is an all-finished book. It, it's an already-been-done book. You just got to go over the story. You just got to know what he did. And some of you today, you don't need a how-to manual. You need a revelation of what Jesus has done for you in your soul. If you get the picture of the gospel, if you realize the magnitude, if you realize the grace of God and the blood of God and the payment he paid so that you could be free, you would walk different, you'd have less anxiety, you'd have less fear, you'd have less worry, and you could stop the <laughs> and just step into the grace that is already available to you. Now, I'm not saying those things are bad. Shout out to Studio 7. That's my guy. I mean it. I'm so grateful. I'm not, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But what we are saying is we got to know what's been done and what we have to do. Oh, come on. This is important. 
What are we needing to do today? I'm so grateful. I want to go over a little bit what has already been done. What has already been done is that Jesus has already saved us. Your faith foundation, your freedom foundation was not laid by you. But your freedom is lived out by the power of the Holy Spirit at work through you. It says no condemnation, but it doesn't say that there was no mistake made. It doesn't say there was no failures. It does not say that we did not screw it up. It did not say that we did not leave God. We know that Abraham lied about his wife. We know that David committed adultery. We know that Peter tried to cut a man's ear off. We know that Eve ate the apple. Always want to blame the women. Right? The truth is that we screw up. And what we need to know today as we sit here is that consequences are earthly, but condemnation is heavenly. It's eternal. And what I want you to know today, there's a massive difference between consequences and condemnation. Today, some of you are living in the consequences of decisions you have made. That is real. Hello, where's my believers at? The, the truth is you make a stupid mistake or you do things over a period of time long enough, you're going to suffer the consequences of that. That is real. What a man sows, he also reaps. But in terms of your eternal condemnation, you have been set free. Izzy, man, she lies a lot lately. We asked her if she did something. Izzy, did you spill your cup? No. Izzy? You just knocked it over. I didn't do that. What the heck? Izzy, you're not dumb. Izzy, did you knock? No. What? Izzy, did you, Izzy, did you just slap your sister? No. She's got a red face, cheek mark across her face. Did you? you know, Izzy, and, and there's this thing. We're going through this process. Like, obviously, there's some behavior issues. Don't judge me. I'm a, we, we're dealing with it too. But as I got into it with her, Izzy has these moments lately, right, Katie? She has these moments lately where she turns towards us and she goes, and as soon as she admits it, she buries her head in our side and starts to weep. <laughs> you're yelling at me and you're mad at me. And she has these crazy meltdowns after. And what I'm realizing is that she's not sensing a consequence. She is feeling condemned. Hmm. She is feeling dirty. She feels like I'm not proud of her. She feels like she let mommy and daddy down. And what we're dealing with with no Izzy right now is not that she has a problem with consequences, because honestly, I think she's a savage. She doesn't really care. I think she just doesn't want to let us down. And I think some of you, you have been living not in consequences. You've been living in condemnation. And you have felt like you have let God down. You felt like you've let your friends down. You've let your community get down. But I came here this Sunday morning to tell you that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Oh, come on. Let Wamanalo hear you today. That is good news. That is good news. See, earthly consequences, Galatians 6, 7 states, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that also he will reap. For the one who sows his own flesh will reap the flesh, reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, to the Spirit will le- reap eternal life. In John 3, 18, after John 3, 16, two verses later, it says, whoever believes in me is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in me is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only Son of God. I want you to imagine today that you are on death row. You're on death row. Imagine you're on death row. And today I tell you, you're free right now. What would you do? What would you do? You were dead. And now you're alive. Do you know we have all been sentenced to death? But through the blood of Jesus, you're free. You should act like a free man. You should talk like a free person. You should walk around and go, you're not going to believe this. I was once dead, but...
but now I am alive. I once didn't have any hope, and now I got all the hope in the world because of what Jesus did. I didn't do it. I didn't work it out. God did it for me. Is this not good news this Sunday morning? Is this not a freedom foundation we need to lay? Is this not a mindset we need to get? The Bible says the renewing and the transforming of our mind is everything so that we can set ourselves apart and free for the work that Jesus has assigned to us. Imagine, imagine you're set free today. But some of you, you feel dirty And for some of you, your cycle of sin is perpetuated by a belief that you are not fully accepted by God's grace. Let me explain. Some of you keep on sinning because you feel dirty. Have you ever had a dirty room? Have you ever thrown your clothes on the ground? You you, you know what it looks like in a dirty room that's clean? You know what it looks like in a dirty room? When you have one more item of clothing, what do you do? Eh, Just one more. One more. But it's so funny, you're in a clean room? How how differently you act in that room. It's so funny how you're different when you, it's some of you, it's like you imagine you haven't showered in three days, and if you haven't showered in three days, don't raise your hand. But imagine you haven't showered in three days. What's another day? But the thing about some of you is that you don't realize you've been cleaned, washed in the blood, that the Savior cleaned up your heart and your mind and your soul. And so you've got a cycle and a mindset that everything around you, including you, is dirty. And I want to tell you today, that is not true. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And you're not good and clean because you're good and clean. You're good and clean because you took off the robes of the flesh and you put on the robes of righteousness. You put on the garment of salvation. And today, you are clean and you are free. How good is that? That is good news. I would rather live with consequences than die in condemnation. And some of you have hidden things. Hello, church. Some of you have have hidden things and you need to face the consequences so that you can live free from the condemnation. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Some of you today need to step out of the darkness and step into the light. No one can do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. And I promise you, as you do that, you will be free. We read in the scripture, it's it's so important that we understand that it, it tells us so clearly that there is a law. Some of you are like, what is the law? There is no condemnation of those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because they belong to the power of the spirit, life has freed us from the power of sin and death that leads to death. Verse 3 says, the law of Moses was unable to save us. What is the law? And You need to go with me for a second. Can we just be studious for a moment? We have to describe because it's very important that we understand in Romans 8 what the law is, Ryan. We have to know what this is because if we're going to grow in our faith, we have to know what God has used in the past in order to get us to this moment. Jesus wasn't always around. This begs the question, well, what did they do before they had Jesus? That's a great question. They used the law. And I want to give you a few things that the law was. Is that okay? You can write these down real quick. The law reveals the holiness of God. The law was a, it reveals the holiness of God. It reflects God's perfect nature. It showed us who God was. So God gave Moses the law. God gave Moses the law, these 613 Levitical laws, and these laws helped them to see how holy God was. The next thing it did, it identified sin because they had no Holy Spirit living inside of them as we do now, the Spirit of God alive in us. They had the law to hold them to the standard that God asked them to live to. That's what we have right now. We have an issue in culture because we have all this freedom, but we've taken the freedom for granted and not abide by the law. And that's the problem with our culture and society. We think that we can just do whatever we want, but we can't because we need the law in order to hold us in in right standing so that we don't cross boundaries. The next thing that the law did is the law guides living. It guides relationships. It taught us, hey, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. Pretty obvious, right? It, it said, hey, don't do this. Don't, don't hate. Don't talk back. Don't be evil. Don't be mean. Don't be cruel. Treat people this way. It was, it was relational. It also taught them how to worship. This is why they had all these things they had to do in the temple. Hey, have the guitar here. Have the drums over there. Have the piano here. God literally gave them very clear instructions on how to live out their worship and how their surface, when to stand, when to sit. I'm going to talk about this in part two next week. 
Number three, it was a caretaker to Christ. I love these words, caretaker. Or you could put the word custodian to Christ in there. What is a custodian? There's a custodian. Can we give it up for the Waimanal Elementary and Intermediate School, all the, all the staff, the custodians? Well, what, what does a custodian do? The custodian takes care of possessions. The caretaker takes care of the possession. The, the caretaker takes care of what is not theirs belongs to someone else. Hello. And that is what the law did. The law was a caretaker to Christ. It was a caretaker to Jesus came. It was, it was what took care of us before God came. Before God sent his own son. It took care of us. But there's three things we need to know in these freedom foundations that the law cannot do and has no power over us anymore. Is that okay? I'm going to give you three things. Are you ready? Some of you are like, this is weird. What are we talking about? The law? Yes, the law. The law. Why? Why is this important? Because many of you grew up in religious systems. We grew up in religious backgrounds. Some of you have issues with church today because some of the religion has been applied to your relationship. Hmm. And you are struggling with your faith because you don't know how to separate condemnation from consequences and relationship from from religion. You don't know how to separate these things. But I want to encourage you to do so today. I want to encourage you that some of you have grew up in systems that you did not have necessarily legalists around you. But you had what the Bible would refer to as Paul the Apostle would call as Judaizers. People who tried to mix. And this is the most gnarly thing. When you try to take salvation message but you miss it with you mess it up with some works and some ability and trying and some manipulation and some control and that's what is so evil when we misuse the bible and what god has given us but i love romans 8 because it it brings us home it lays a, a freedom foundation so three things that the law cannot do the number one thing that the law cannot do the law cannot claim me somebody say the law cannot claim me The law cannot claim me. It says in verse 2, and I'm going to go through verses 2, 3, and 4, and we're done in the next 12 minutes. Are you ready? Is this okay? And it says, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. This is the emancipation. This is the freedom that you have in Christ. When you enter the kingdom of God, you have diplomatic immunity. Do you know what that is? A diplomat can go from region to region and cross over and the laws do not apply to them because they have been freed. You have been freed. Some of you have been most wanted not in your state but in your sin. You know somebody most wanted in a state? Some of you, you were most wanted for sin. You, you, the, the devil had you on the most wanted list. We're going to kill them. We're going to destroy them. We're going to cause this to kill them. But I'm so grateful that we didn't cross a state line. We crossed a spirit line. Oh, come on, church. We crossed a spirit line. And you know who drew that line? Jesus drew that line. Jesus drew that line in the sand by the blood of Jesus. Do you know there is a spiritual border control? That's right, the blood of Jesus and the cross of Calvary is our border patrol. That's the thing that covers us. That's why the children of Israel, they put the blood over the doorpost so that they would be passed over. You see, there was once a day of condemnation and death and all the plagues came and all the hardship came and all the pain came and they paid for what they did. But because of the grace of God and through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we no longer are under the law of sin and death we are free and whom the son says free is free indeed oh let freedom ring let freedom ring come on church do you believe it today we are free because of the blood of Jesus oh Jesus we thank you God we praise you I'm gonna say this next week so just you're gonna have to hear it this service too I'm sorry I was in I was in a class I was in Bible I was in a Bible school school class in, in, my, in my 11th grade of high school and I remember I drove to school on a Wednesday night. Everyone have a Wednesday night Bible study at my little Christian school and I, was, I just got a car. I had a Jeep Wrangler. I was so cool and, and I drove to this little Bible study and, and on then the Peter Nunziante. There was no worship. It was a little cafeteria, it was a little schoolroom, about 12 of us, most of them custodians. And he opened up the book of Romans and he contrasted with law and grace. And I'll never forget, it was the first time I ever began to worship God just by the simple reading of the word. It started to hit me what he did. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. 
What did Jesus do for me? I love what Martin Luther said, the more you handle it, the more precious it becomes. The more you look into it, you're like, what? That's why we're not going to rush through this. We're going to take our time. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I believe today some of you are going to walk in out here differently today. Not because your circumstances change, but because of the Christ in you is transforming you from the inside out. You have crossed over from the state of sin to God's country. Who's grateful for God's country today? I'm grateful for Waimanalo. I'm grateful for God's country we're in. But you didn't cross over into a natural country. You crossed into a spiritual country. Thanks be to God. All the praise to him. All the glory to him. All the adoration. The, the pastor doesn't get the credit. The preacher doesn't get the credit. No, all glory to God. No, 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 I didn't build this. God already built it. I just simply tell you about the foundations that have been laid by him. The faithfulness of our God. And as we step into it, what's possible? Number two, the law for number one, what? The law cannot what? Claim you. Number two, the law cannot condemn me. The law cannot condemn me. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, the law cannot condemn me. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature, verse 3. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared the end of sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sin. This is something we have to know, and I debated on whether or not to talk about it, but it's the hypostatic union. Everyone say hypostatic union. People are like, what the heck is that? Don't worry, it's not that important. All it simply means is this, is that Jesus is fully man and fully God. It means that Jesus is 100% man, he's 100% God. It means that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for humanity's worst problem. It means that Jesus, imagine a king becoming the perfect sacrifice, a roaring lion becoming a perfect lion, a lamb, a roaring lion becoming a perfect lamb. Imagine God took his own son, he humbled him lower than the angels, became the perfect sacrifice who knew, knew who was not sin and knew no sin, but became sin for the sins of the the world so that we could be free through the precious blood of Jesus. He became the spotless lamb. He was fully God and fully man. He wasn't 50-50. He was fully. And because of that, all the wrath, all the judgment of God, all the pain of God, all fell on his shoulders. Hebrews 10.4 tells us, it says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins. I love Eugene Peterson in the message translation. He says this, when Jesus sent his son, he went for the jugular of sin. That's what Jesus did. He didn't deal with it remotely and unimportantly. Everyone know remote learning, remote school, remote hospital visits, remote doctors. Like I got my remote doctor. Man, that's tough, remote doctor. Uh, if you're a doctor in here and you're adopting it, it's amazing. But, but this is what we do is everything today is remote. I don't want to be too close. Keep some separation. And, and I'm so grateful that Jesus didn't deal with us remotely. No, 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 no. There's so much beauty in technology. I'm so thankful for it. But Jesus, he was not remote with us. No, 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 no. He came down. And he became a man just like us. He dwelt among us. You see, he, he hung out with local fishermen. He was a local boy with some local people. And he started to tell them about the grace of God and what he was about to do. He held their hands. He wept with them. He cried with them. He went through pain with them. He suffered with them. I'm so grateful not for the remote, but for the local. I'm so grateful for the local church. I'm so grateful for a local God. I'm so grateful for a local Savior. I'm so grateful for the local presence and power of Almighty. Mighty God and the blood of Jesus. We serve a local God. We serve a God who is with us in our pain, who walks through our pain with us. He is near. He is with us. A lot of times Paul uses, his, as he's in Rome, and Roman systems are set up a lot like the constitution and the government here is set up so he uses a lot of local laws to help illustrate things that everyone whether jew gentile or greek whoever you were there living in that time in that day you would have lived under and so he uses illustrations of the law that everyone could understand 
We have a concept here in America that we call double jeopardy, the law of double jeopardy. The law of double jeopardy simply tells us here in America that you cannot be tried twice for the same crime. You see, we've all committed a crime. We've sinned against God. And we'll, the wages of sin are death. That's what we deserve. But through the gift of Jesus, through the redemption, through the power of the blood of Jesus, we are set free. And, and we can't be tried twice for what Jesus already paid for. But I screwed up last night. It's a consequence, potentially. She might be pregnant. You might have something you're going to take with you to your grave that will be on your body as a mark of that sin and consequence. There's no doubt about it. I'm going through a really hard time and I'm struggling and I feel like I've brought a lot of this on myself. That might be true. There might be some consequences you're dealing with you today. But I got to tell you something, friend. There is no condemnation. You are free. But how? How can I be a slave and be free? Oh, that's good news. I got good news for you. Sometimes we, we deal with slavery here. But I'm so grateful for all of eternity we're set free. I'm so grateful that we live in this tension between the natural world and the spiritual one. And today, God, he wants to set you free. <laughs> Truth is, we look around and it's like, man, what do we do now that we're free? And number three, as we close, and I'm, I'm finished, the law cannot control me. So number one, the law cannot claim me. The law cannot condemn me because we cannot suffer double jeopardy. A man cannot be tried twice for the same crime. Jesus has already tried you for your sin. So the law cannot claim me. The law cannot condemn me. Number three, the law, it cannot control me. Somebody say, the law cannot control me. And the verse 4 says, he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully sacrificed for us. The just requirement. That means that there was something that had to be paid. It had to be paid, but Jesus, he paid it for us because Jesus was totally just. He was totally holy. He paid the price so we wouldn't have to. We no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, follow the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. And we're going to go through Romans 8, and I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about this book of Romans 8. And I know some of you, this is your first time checking out our church, and some of you haven't been to church in a really long time, and you're just praying this thing doesn't get weird. Just be honest. You're just like, please don't let this be weird like my mom's church. Please, please. Be honest. Be honest. It's okay. It's always church. It's a, let's be real. Please let this not be weird. Please, please, please. But there's a part of this that, that, that if you're living for Jesus, you, you're going to be a little weird. And I'm going to say this because you're an alien and a stranger to this world. Because you don't do things that this world does. And one of the things that we have is we have the Father and the Son. We have the Father. We have the Father, God in heaven. And we have the Son, Jesus, who was sent. But Jesus said this. He said, it's better that I go because if I don't, I can't send one that is better than me. So he says, he calls it better. So interesting here. We have a text and we can dive. We're going to, in the next several weeks, we're going to dive deeper into it. But, but we hear, see in Romans 8, the word Holy Spirit, Spirit of God is used 19 times. So we're reading all about the theology of our faith. But here coupled with that is the Spirit of God. It's the power of the Spirit of God that enters you. Because now you have left a natural country and you have entered a spiritual one. Because now you don't live in this natural way of doing things. Now you live a spiritual way. And one of the things that we have available to us is the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, to help us not live the way we used to live, but live freely and live lightly. Some of you are like, well, how do I do this? Well, first you have to admit that you are a sinner. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Who needs Jesus today? If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. Or maybe you knew him at one point, but you're like, this is my turning day. This is my emancipation day. I'm turning from sin and I'm turning to God. Anybody in this room want to say, I'm doing that today? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone like, I want to be free today. I don't want to live this way anymore. I've tried religion. I've tried things. Actually, I need to come back to Jesus again. This is like my 15th time. I don't care how many times it's been. Just come back to Jesus again. Can you say this with me? Say, Jesus, I invite you in my heart. I ask you to forgive me, free me for all eternity. I make you Lord in Jesus' name. You're saved. That's it. It is by faith that we are saved, lest any man should boast. I'm so grateful for that. Okay, now, now, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? I got good news for you. Again, 
You don't need a theological degree to do this. You receive Jesus by faith. You receive the Spirit of God by faith. I got a scripture over there called Luke 11. Where is Luke 11? Is it up on the screens or no? I'm going to grab this real quick. Sorry. It's not his fault. It's my fault. It's not you. It's me. Luke 11, 13 says this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for Him? How good is that? So natural people, we give all these good gifts. Do you know what the gift of the Holy Spirit is? Do you know what the, the Holy Spirit is? It's a gift. It's a gift that God gives us so that we don't live this out naturally anymore. We live this out spiritually. So no matter what happens to you after this moment, when you don't have me yelling at you, the howly guy from stage yelling at you on Monday, you now can walk this out, not by yourself, but with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that this spirit, the same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead, it can live on the inside of us. Who wants the Holy Spirit? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you, everyone in this room, to stand their feet. If you want the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray right now that you would invite the Holy Spirit back into your life again. Some of you, you, you've invited so many things into your life. You've invited how-to programs. You've invited so many different things on your social media feed. You have invited so many different people into your intimacy and circle. But today I want you to make room for the Holy Spirit. I want you to open up your heart and say, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come in. I, I need more of you today, Holy Spirit. I can't, I can't do this alone. And this is not a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. And, and you might be asking, how do I do this? You, all you do is you ask and you receive. You ask, say, Holy Spirit, come. Some of you are in here like, I've never done this. Maybe you want to. Maybe you want to open up your hands right now and lift up your hands. This is a, a sign of receiving. How do you receive a gift? You, you open your hand and you say, I want it. I want it. I want the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're in here and you're like, man, I've, I've, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough. You are good enough. Not because you're good, because he's good. And he gave you the Holy Spirit. And you can ask him right now. You can ask him to come in. And Some of you, you have places in your heart, your mind that You've given God some of you, but today it's time to give God all of you. And you're going to invite him in, and we're going to sing a song called Holy Spirit Come. You're welcome here. And I want you to sing this today. If you want this, I want you to sing this over you. I want you to sing this over your children if you have it. If you have a family today, I want you to sing this over your family. If you've got a community today, I want you to sing it over your community. If you've got a hidden part in your life that you know you need to confess to God, I'm going to ask you to confess that sin. Say, I don't want this pornography addiction anymore. I don't want this hidden sin anymore. I don't want to go back this way anymore. I don't want to hold on to this thing that used to be freedom, but now is slavery. I want to let it go, and I want the Holy Spirit to fill me. Come on, why don't we sing this together? Why don't we ask the Holy Spirit to come in? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Thank you for joining us today online. I want to take a moment, I want to speak to the people who just decided to follow Jesus. We want you to know that is the greatest decision you can possibly make. And we as a church family, we are here to help you on that journey. Just below me, there's a link. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can click on that and get next steps. Our encouragement to you is find a local church, a community of faith that can come around you and inspire you and encourage you on the amazing journey of following Jesus. I also want to take a moment and thank our giving community, those who financially support this vision so that we can be a family and help people find faith in Jesus Christ. We love you so much, church. Thank you, and we'll see you back here next week.